How can you heal a damaged mind? Welcome, Mere Mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information that is within to extract some themes you might not have thought about. To also know more about the mind, the body, and trauma, we do have The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk with the subtitle Mind, Brain, and Body in the Transformation of Trauma. So this book was first published in 2014, pretty recently, and it's about 350 pages of, in length of the actual writing, add an extra 70 pages or so for the appendices, the notes, the, you know, all that sort of stuff in the back. It took me probably about nine hours to get through in total. The writing on it is actually rather dense. There's not many two line breaks in the paragraphs and things like this, and the writing is rather small. So there's a lot to get through in this book. It's a book focused on mental health, plus the the what, the whys, the who's, the hows, I suppose, of PTSD. So this is post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's five parts in this, and I'll read out the titles of these so you get a rough idea of what it is. So we have part one, the rediscovery of trauma. Part two, this is your brain on trauma. Part three, the minds of children. Part four, the imprint of trauma. And part five, paths to recovery. So there's focusing a lot on trauma, obviously, Uh, but the parts themselves are really related to, I guess, the history of it, how these words, names were coming up, his dealings with Vietnam veterans, things like this, the brain science, which parts of the brain are being activated or not activated when people are talking about trauma or have experienced it. Uh, The third part is about the child and beginnings and how a lot of this actually does occur mostly in the childhood sort of region. Memory is a fourth part of the recollections, how people talk about it, if they can, sometimes it's repressed, sometimes it's not. And then part five is the healing process. How can you actually get beyond what has happened to you? So it's a real mix of personal case studies. He himself was a a scientist, a a person trying to help uh, people, a psychiatrist. Um, So he has a lot of case studies in this book talking about Sarah or Jane or Max or whoever it is most of the names i assume all of the names have been changed for privacy sake the hard sciences so this is really looking at uh, brain studies of what's a, you know actual physical chemical reactions that are going on some kind of soft science as well which is more the behavioral side of things the the people to people sort of side the case studies or the um you know surveys and things like this Uh, And then there's a bit of personal opinion chucked in right at the end as well. A lot of the book has this kind of underlying tone of it's very uh, empathetic. There's a lot of understanding, patience, and I guess I'd I'd even call it kind of grounded positivity. It's very positive in general. It's, it's It's a book not to lament the human condition, but or to almost explain how we can get beyond some horrible things that have happened to us and that we do to each other as well. Before we jump into the main themes, I want to talk about the author, Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, He was 1943. His name is uh, the way it is because he was born in the Netherlands, but moved to the United States, um, I'm pretty sure, relatively after at least that's where he studied. He became a psychiatry professor at uh, Boston University, and he spent much time as a practitioner as well as a researcher. So he had kind of dabbled in both sides. So some of the studies in these books are actually ones that he's done himself or he was talking about, yeah, we had this, um, you know, case study. We had this program to try and help these people. This is what we found from that. And he's had a rather long, numerous career. So uh, he has a, a lot to talk about. Let's get into the first theme, which is understandably trauma. Why all the acronyms? As you're reading this, you're going to find there is just so many that are littered throughout this book. And I'll read some of them out at the end. But uh, it's mostly related to psychological trauma. Um, so the PTSD is is probably the main aspect of this. And uh, despite the title, it's not really about the body itself. So it's not talking about people who have had trauma, which in the original sense of the word, I believe, referred to actual physical damage done to the body. This is pretty much all about the mental side of things, mental trauma, but words change over time. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. So it's really about the brain changes. It's talking about the body reactions that people have to certain circumstances. And so this will be things like shallow breathing, (laughs) uh, a narrowing of vision. If you're talking about a certain thing that's happened to you, the heart rate 
um, going through the roost, the 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 fight. What is it? Fight, flight, and uh, freeze responses that can occur with some people. He's really talking about okay, there is, uh, you know, traumatic things that have happened to someone, whether it be uh, viewing a car accident, whether it be uh, you know in war of things you've done, of things um, that have been done to you, uh, all of these sorts of things. It doesn't particularly matter, it's, but it's it's uh, it's the physical, it's the mental side of this and how that represents in the body rather than, you know, I got my arm cut off and I'm, or part of my arm cut off and I'm trying to like relearn how to, to live in life again. And, you know, the actual, I suppose, physical recuperation, it's not related to that at all. So uh, what you find though, is that there's so many acronyms and, and these lead to these, I suppose, out of control and even uncontrollable situations because of all of these reactions that people have to to all um to these things so um we find that uh, what the researchers what the doctors are doing to people who are coming to them with who have these reactions they're they're diagnosing them with all these disorders so i'm going to jump over to here to page 108 and 109 and basically what they're doing is they were showing pictures uh to these young children of it, it was kind of like an ambiguous picture. It could be like a lady looking out of a window um, and she's pregnant. And, you know, what, what would these children react to that? What, what would they first say to these things? And so the responses of the clinic children were alarming. The most innocent images stirred up intense feelings of danger, aggression, sexual arousal and terror. We had not selected these photos because they had some hidden meaning that sensitive people could uncover. They were ordinary images of everyday life. We could only conclude that for abused children, the whole world is filled with triggers. As long as they can imagine only disastrous outcomes to relatively benign situations, anybody walking into a room, any stranger, any image on a screen or on a billboard might be perceived as a harbinger of catastrophe. In this light, the bizarre behavior of the kids at the clinic's children made perfect sense. To my amazement, staff discussions on the unit rarely mentioned the horrific real life experiences of the children and the impact of, the, of those traumas on their feelings, thinking and self-regulation. Instead, their medical records were filled with diagnostic labels, conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder for the angry and rebellious kids or bipolar disorder. ADHD was a comorbid diagnosis for almost all. Was the underlying trauma being obscured by this blizzard of diagnoses? And then he goes on to talk more about how all of these things start happening and, and later in the book, why all of these uh, disorders, diagnoses pop up. Part of this is due to just the field of medicine of, of, um, of I guess, like that kind of science. It tends to have a lot of these acronyms because so many times they're dealing with drugs. And so instead of having this, you know, dimethyl, they put blah, 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 blah. They just shorten it down to like DMP or whatever. And so this kind of creeps in, but we do see there is PTSD, there's ADHD, there's MDMA, which is standing for, for a drug, uh, MDMR, EMDR, APA, the DSM, there's all of these acronyms and it's not just related to a disorder. It could be, I think the DSM is like the diagnosis and statistics manual of mental health or something like this. APA is the Amer American Psychiatry Association. There's, there's all of these acronyms and I think the reason there is so much of that in this book is there's, it's almost like there's so much variability with how people can react to trauma and their physical reactions, their, the way they behave. And there's not enough people and time to really be able to give them the care that's needed. And so it is somewhat necessary, at least in the American medical system to give them a, uh, a label and then that label can be treated with drugs. And so we'll talk more about that um, shortly. And yeah, let's jump onto that. So healing strategies for recovery is the second theme that I pulled out for this. And it kind of needs to start with understanding of what's actually going on. What is someone um, really feeling? Why are they taking certain actions or reactions? And this is where the kind of American systems really seems to fail because they do like these these labeling, these acronyms, this person has this, okay, we treat them with this and, and move on. And so it's kind of like in and out. Whereas what we see from reading a lot of this book is that these are super complex 
multifaceted problems that require a lot of time to get through. You can't, you're not going to build up the trust with someone who's been abused as a child and has trust issues over the course of a 15 minute doctor session. It needs a lot more than that. So what we see is uh, he shows how it's not a narrative. It's not just people thinking these things in their head. You can actually see when they're in an fMRI machine or in some sort of scan, brain scanning machine, and an image shows up, you can see certain parts of their brain react differently compared to, I suppose, the normal um, average adult or average child who doesn't have this part of the brain working. And then if you look, it's, you know, the thamylus, and then that is typically associated with, you know, fear or fight responses and things like this. So you can see, okay, all right, there's some science behind this and it's not just people making stuff up. Uh, and a lot of this is categorized by immobilization. So something happened to them and they weren't able to react as you normally would, which is if your dad is coming at you with a, a knife or a, a belt to you know whip the shit out of you, the normal thing to do when someone is doing that to you is that you run. But of course, if, if you're a young child, for example, you know, home is meant to be the safe place. Where are you going to run to? You're going to run to the wild streets outside where there's also kids who are going to bully you. Are you going to run to your mother, but she's, you know, kind of enabling your father because she's too scared to stand up for you? And all of these sorts of things we see, a lot of it is the the stress is is caused by these people being stuck in situations they can't get out of, essentially torture. And um, this is where a lot of deep care is needed. And um, I think that's probably one of the things that stands out for this book. And I'm going to read out this passage here on page 73, which is the... I suppose, sum up of a, a, a chapter called Running for Your Life, The Anatomy of Survival. And he says, the challenge of trauma treatment is not only dealing with the past, but even more enhancing the quality of day-to-day -day experience. One reason that traumatic memories become dominant in PTSD is that it's so difficult to feel truly alive right now. When you can't be fully here, you go to places where you did feel alive, even if those places are filled with horror and misery. Many treatment approaches for traumatic stress focus on desensitizing patients to their past with the expectation that re-exposure to their traumas will reduce emotional outbursts and flashbacks. I believe that this is based on a misunderstanding of what happens in traumatic stress. We must most of all help our patients to live fully and securely in the present. In order to do that, we need to help bring those brain structures that deserted them when they were overwhelmed by trauma back. Desensitization may make you less reactive, but if you cannot feel satisfaction in ordinary everyday things like taking a walk, cooking a meal, or playing with your kids, life will pass you by. And I think that's a really important point with related to the healing strategies, because a lot of these people who experience something really traumatic, they have a self-care or they did something which enabled them to get through an absolutely awful situation, whether this be um, you know, incestuous rape by their father that appeared way too often in this book. Um, and in, in the sense, like how, how terrible is that, that this actually happened so often, uh, or it's, you know, a beating physical violence or even just emotional abuse from a, a parent who didn't perhaps want that, that child. And they were forced into this situation. There's a lot of multi complex things and it's it's not just like you know these bad people are just doing these things it's like these bad people were hurt themselves the, the classic hurt people hurt people sort of uh, thing going on and so these things that these people do they make sense in the short term but not in the long term so in this situation just there he was talking about how people will do something to feel alive. And so this can be extreme risk taking behavior such as driving a motorbike really fast of um, having like unprotected sex in various locations with various people of putting themselves into these situations where they, they at least can feel something because they're so numb to everyday life because they had to numb themselves due to something that had happened to them. And so that is kind of more the dissociation thing. He's got a really terrible story of this um, poor young, poor, poor young girl who basically when her father was raping her, she would describe herself as to going up in the clouds. And so she was looking down upon, you know, her own body upon the situation, kind of like a, um, I, I don't know what you call that, like a, a 
disconnection from the brain to something else to another state of consciousness and it was like that was happening to someone else that wasn't happening to her so you can kind of see the split personality type thing uh, coming up a lot of people just respond with anger because anger actually makes them feel something um, some interesting situations of you know why would someone want to be obese well if it was a female rape victim um, obese people and you know they're kind of overlooked sexually so there is some sort of you know uh, I, I guess sense of of safety being hidden behind uh, being unattractive for example uh, drugs uh, obviously for either the numbing aspect they can provide or vice versa for the feeling alive aspects and you can find uh, various um, uh, differences bet between those two so you see a lot of these people will create strategies for themselves which uh, they're they're good in the sense they elate, enable them to live and not go insane but long-term strategy wise you don't want to be making yourself obese you don't want to be taking drugs all the time you don't want to be um, you know, giving into anger in the slightest of situations to get through, um, you know, the, the fact that you were bullied as a kid. And so now you respond only with machismo, anger, aggression, because you don't want to be that kid anymore. You didn't want to be that, that person who was bullied. And so now every situation you're in, you respond to that, which is inappropriate in general everyday life. So how are some of the better strategies of healing? Well, he lists out a fair few. There's EMDR, which is eye movement and desensitization and reprocessing, which is this basically you'll, you, as you're talking about your, your trauma, they do this thing where they like wave a finger in front of your eyes. And so your eyes are going back and forth, left and right. And there's a little bit of science, not, not too much that shows that this, this can help. Uh, yoga, so get, kind of getting into your body and being able to release things through that way. Theater, so actually going out and and, and presenting on a stage or kind of becoming someone else or uh, dance, I think is somewhat mentioned as well. Neurofeedback, so this is where there's a certain alpha or theta uh, uh, gamma waves in the brain and it, actually being able to somewhat change that with you know electrodes on the head and, and being able to change that. Uh, there's all sorts of things. Talk therapy is a lot of this. There was this one called, I think it was structuring, which sounded very bizarre um, of these kind of enabling people to somewhat relive it out, their trauma with other participants. And it's kind of, I would say it's almost mindfulness is, is how I would describe it. But he's got a fair few strategies in the end. Um, some of these are are good. Some of these are a little bit iffy. Uh, and obviously there's the... Um, drugs as well although he doesn't really talk about that much um for a particular reason which i'm going to get onto right now which is my observations and takeaways uh one of the cool things about this book i guess is that he got to witness a lot of the history born in 1943 so he was you know doing psychiatry in the 60s so he got a good you know 60 years i suppose or 50 years of experiencing what was happening in the field related to trauma. And so, you know, before he started, PTSD wasn't a thing. Um, FMRI scans had never existed. The default state network, the autonomic nervous system, the vagus nerve, all of these concepts which have been unlocked due to better science and, and which are kind of legit science, these are actual things. Uh, these, these are things that he kind of got to witness and it was kind of cool seeing that firsthand in this book. Um, and you can also see, I suppose, what he would describe as maybe the the biggest error fallacy that occurred just in the the whole Amer American medical system, because he's um, speaking from that context, was he was somewhat lamenting that the drugs and I would call it the harder science, the the chemical um, they they prioritize the chemical over the behavioral. So in this case, it basically means instead of focusing there's two paths ahead of you uh, someone's got a problem do you look at the brain chemistry and then try and fix that and alter that with um, some sort of drug so whether this be prozac zoloft any of the ssris any of the psychotropic drugs something like that or do you go over the behavioral approach um, and basically what happened was the american system at least chose to focus on the chemical so this is <laughs> 
pushing pushing drugs, peddling drugs, I guess, if you want to call it that way, which I'm sure helped a lot of people. But he he sees the, uh, I suppose, the detriment to that in that you can have this thing where everyone is just getting, you know, PTSD, ADHD, this disorder, that disorder, cognitive dissociation disorder, whatever it is. And then here's a drug for that. Next, you know, like get out the door. This will this will help you so- solve your problems, and it actually doesn't solve them in the long term. Uh, whereas he's more of the behavioral talk therapy. Come in. We we need to spend you know 50 hours building up trust together. I need to hear your stories. I need to uh, understand what you're going through so I can provide the best recommendation suggestion to helping you get through this. Um, which are those i don't i'm not a uh, doctor i don't have any qualm in the medical field so i don't know (laughs) uh, if which which of those is better of the two approaches but you know it's it's somewhat a historical book when you read through this and go like oh okay i can see how these sorts of things occurred um what you'll notice though in the book is that it's got this slow shift to unscientific uh or or any any kind of mentions this kind of calls this out and in a in a certain sense, um, my own little research just after this made me a bit iffy on some of the things, particularly the M- EMDR, uh, the eye movement. It, it didn't doesn't seem to be really really supported by super hard science. So that one, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm sure it can kind of help people. I don't know for sure. You know, um, this is when you're getting into the behavior and human behavior and all the complex things that are related to that the scientific method doesn't work <laughs> as well as uh as it does for things like uh, chemistry and physics so and math so that's that's okay um you kind of just have to accept that and be like all right you know what what i kind of took out from this was i think most of these strategies it doesn't really matter what it is as long as you've got a kind understanding counselor it'll probably help improve the person <laughs> it's probably not even related to the actual therapy or the because some of these are like yeah you got to do this thing and then to become a practitioner you got to pay this amount and it's like oh okay you know this kind of seems more like a a marketing opportunity a business rather than something that's really designed to help people you know whatever the it seems like it's more just if you have someone who's helping who's who's kind and understanding they can do whatever they could do the eye movement thing they could do these reenacting of plays they could do whatever and that is the sort of thing that will probably be more beneficial having a therapist to talk over and to be able to try and explore your um your trauma the things that have happened to you and put them in a a context where you can understand them or live with them perhaps not you're never going to fully heal i imagine from from some of these terrible things but it it was you could see the book kind of devolving a little bit away from the more harder sciences or the the more the more things which are a a super solid and legit and um you know the brain scans and things like this uh and then oh man the the one thing that really just ticked me off a little bit was right in his summary he started putting talking about politics a bit which what he justifies as you need to solve the politics to solve all of these people uh, experiencing these things, the epidemic of child abuse, the amount of rape and incest and things like this. And in a certain sense, that is correct uh, if you could help solve some of these things. But it just throwing out and and like some of the politics that he suggested right at the end and it was it was really brief it's just such a random thing to have in the book it, it kind of left it on a sour note for me because i agreed with some of them or is something that i probably would say yeah that's probably a better general strategy some of them not it's beside the point it's more just he chucked out these random things right at the end uh and it didn't make sense for the book i i I didn't I don't understand why why he put them in there um because you'd need a whole book to talk about these things to show why that general strategy or it is better to do this thing or that thing so yeah anyway just look out for that <laughs> and my last observation here was honestly I'm amazed at what people can endure there are some really horrific stories in here um and I give the benefit of the doubt to most of them that these people did experience these things uh, and I think you kind of have to a, a lot of the time. And um, I'll, I'll talk more in the summary about exactly why it's probably best to do that. Um, but you could see that uh, people, the the 
human capacity to endure torture, like just straight up torture is what some of these stories and people experienced is crazy because I, me personally, it's like, I feel like I'd go insane. Perhaps maybe I would come up with some of the same strategies, the short term things, which help you get through it, but in long term, uh, a detrimental, but it's still like, Jesus, they're still alive. They still managed to get through this. This is, um, uh, yeah, just uh, amazed at the human capacity to, um, to be able to endure, I suppose. And so, yeah, let's get on to my summary. It's a dense read that was more scientific than not. So even though I was saying at the end, it was getting a little bit iffy. Um, it, it was pretty solid read. I didn't, there wasn't too many things that stood out to me as being like, Oh, this is getting into, yeah, like the, the unscientific making claims, which can't be verified sort of strat, um, territory. I was worried it might be a, a victim enabling book because a lot of the discussion I hear about trauma is, eh, yeah, it kind of feels like it's, oh man, I went through something really traumatic and, you know, I need special attention and care. And it's, it's kind of doing it as this victim status, this, this, um, maybe it's just the narrative maybe it's just social media i don't know but it 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 just felt like a book where it was it was really designed for people who had gone through something really difficult terrible and how they can help heal themselves and and move beyond that rather than the look at me i'm so special um give me special attention or anything like that it really he, he was coming from a good place the tone is of the book is very important the semantics somewhat as well you might say like oh Karen, like victim enabling versus empowering versus healing what's the difference between these words you know in a certain sense there isn't that much but also he talks in the book about how the you know labeling someone with this, this disorder or that one you know the semantics actually do make a little bit of a difference because people can treat you differently if you have this one versus that one, or you might be given this drug instead of doing talk therapy or anything like that. So uh, it is kind of important. Uh, I personally didn't learn much new. I, I knew a lot of these terms before uh, and the new stuff that I did learn in here kind of felt irrelevant. It, you know, the EMDR, for example, I'd, I'd never heard of that before. And looking it up afterwards, it kind of seemed like it was on the uh, the pseudoscience sort of strategy, or it just didn't have a lot of backing up to verify some of the claims that he was making. So it's kind of irrelevant, at least for my uh, understanding. But what the book did make me do was be much more appreciative of number one, my own upbringing, like, man, I had it lucky. I was, you know, amazing parents, amazing school, amazing friends, nothing, nothing bad happened to me. So, uh, you know, I, I, I thankfully don't have to, um, I can't, I can't connect with these people who have gone through these absolutely terrible things on that sense of me having done it as well. But it, it gives me, a, I suppose, another layer of compassion for people just in general, because you never know who's gone through something absolutely terrible as a child or even as an adult. And I think that is a, a helpful thing to, to know and to be able to respond to in my own everyday life in a more compassionate manner as well, which I, um, is, it's a, it's a book useful for, for kind of understanding people a little bit deeper and just the amount of abuse that is, is heartbreaking just from these studies. It's not, he doesn't give too much of the actual data statistics. This is how many people are abused. This is because once again, it's, it's sort of subjective, but it is, it is a sad book to read in that, in that sense where it's just like, Tam, man, there's a, there's a lot of, pain and suffering in the world and um uh and it still continues so yeah not not the the finest of books to read overall i'm going to give the body keeps the score by bessel van der kolk a six and a half out of ten uh, if you're interested in trauma i i think it's a a decent book to read from a scientific perspective which was not too much on the pseudoscience sort of end of things it, it very much felt like he he'd spent 50 years in the science, in this field and so knew it quite deeply. So, yep, that is it for today. My memorialize, thank you for joining me to the end of this video. What are your thoughts on trauma? The body keeps a score. Have you read this book? Have you read anything else by Bessel van der Kolk? I'd love to know all of these things. The best way to do that, obviously, is by leaving a comment just down below. If you're there as well and want to hit the notification bell, subscribe, blah, 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 all that sort of thing. It's cool and I enjoyed it, um, but 
yeah, I would just really love to know your thoughts on this. And uh, I would also recommend checking out the Mere Models podcast, a little um, link on your screen now. Uh, because I talk a lot about these sort of ideas with my co-host Juan and yeah, it's just a, another channel where you can connect perhaps more deeply with me, with the mere models and, um, understand where we're coming from a lot of times as well. So, uh, that is it for today. I do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Ciao for now. Kyron out.